Hello everyone, welcome back. And in today's video, we're going to we're going to be solving AIT's problems from mechanics. So let's begin with the first question. So, so we have a block of mass M1, which is in limiting equilibrium, meaning that the friction over here is limiting. And the friction coefficient uh, between this surface and the block is given to be 0.5. You know, as everything was in equilibrium, now this mass M2 over here is given a velocity V0 that is perpendicular to the string. So then we have to talk about the initial accelerations and the initial radii of curvature of the trajectory followed by this mass over here. So this is how the situation is looking like. It's given in the problem that initially, initially this block over here is in limiting equilibrium, which means the friction, which basically means the friction acting along the surface is nothing but mu times n, which is mu m1 g. Now, because this block over here is also in equilibrium, before the velocity was given, the tension would have to balance its weight, which is m2g. So which basically means the tension in the string is m2g. And now balancing out these two forces, what we obtain is m1 equals 2m2. Okay guys, so now the thing is this block over here is projected with a velocity of v0 towards the right. Now if this string was not present here, then this block would have moved, this block would have performed a projectile motion, right? But because of the presence of this string, the displacement in dt seconds is going to be something like this. So basically this is going to move along a circle so let's say our observer is actually is actually standing on this block m1 and is moving along with it okay so now if uh, according to this observer over here this string over here is now fixed which means this mass m2 will move in a circle according to this guy uh, which basically means the trajectory of this mass m2 with respect to our observer over here is going to be circular so in this frame of our observer it must have an acceleration of v0 square by l in this direction because it's moving in a circle of radius l so now the thing is guys the only force which is capable of providing this force this acceleration is a tension force, right? The tension force in the string has to increase in order to provide it an acceleration of V0 square by L in this direction, which basically means this block over here will also accelerate because it's already in limiting friction, right? So if the tension increases by a little bit, this is going to accelerate. So with respect to ground frame, so our M1 mass is also accelerating. So now if we go back to ground frame, then this M2 will have an acceleration in the downward direction as well, which will be equal in magnitude to this A because of string constraint. Now guys, if you guys got a doubt that is it violation of the string constraint, then the answer is no, because this V0 square by L, what it's doing is providing the centripetal acceleration, meaning it's changing the direction of this velocity V0, whereas this acceleration A is actually providing it a velocity in the downward direction. Okay, because of the string constraint, we know that this length is going to go up and this acceleration is actually doing the work of increasing that length. So this is not a violation of the string constraint. Okay, now let's write down F equals MA equations. So for the mass M2, uh, we can say the tension force T minus M2G equals M times the net acceleration, which is V0 square by L minus A. And for the mass M1, we can say T minus limiting friction, which is mu M1G, M1 multiplied by A. Now guys, mu m1 and m2 is the same. So if you subtract these two equations, the LHS is going to be zero. m1 is two times of m2. So this is going to become v0 square by L minus 3a. And from here, what we obtain is a equals v0 square divided by 3L. So the ground frame acceleration of this block over here is v0 square by 3L. And the ground frame acceleration of m2 is going to be a minus v0 square by L, which would be two v0 square divided by 3L. So option C and option B are correct. Okay. Okay guys. So now uh, the radii of curvature of the trajectory of M2 at time t equal to zero is, let's call it as R, the net speed squared divided by the normal acceleration. And the net normal acceleration is 2 V0 squared divided by 3L. And from here, we get the radii of curvature as 3L by 2, which means option D is also correct. So the answer to this problem is option B, C, D. So now let's move on to the next question. We have four particles that are located at the vertices of a square and the side length of the square is A. They all move simultaneously with constant speed V with the first particle always heading for the second, second for the third, and the third for the fourth. So this is basically a four particle chasing problem. So what they're asking is, so we have to find the distance covered and the acceleration and the radii of curvature. Okay guys, so this is the initial configuration. So now the displacement of the particles will be in the direction of the instantaneous velocity. So after dt seconds, this particle over here will move by a small amount. Similarly, all of these will move by a small amount, something like this. And if you join all these four points, the locus is again going to be a square. So as you guys can see, they will keep for, uh, forming squares. What will happen is at the end, they will all converge at the point 
at the center of the square. So the important thing in this question is the rate at which the distance between any two particles is decreasing. So let's figure this out. So if you observe uh, these two particles over here, let's say the distance between them is r, the rate at which r is re reducing is actually v, right? Because this v is actually perpendicular, right? So dr by dt is going to be minus v at the initial instant. So now let's observe the diagram that we obtained for a time after tt seconds. So even in this case, if uh, let's just say this is particle number one, this is particle number two, the distance between one and two is still decreasing at a constant rate of v. So this is the unique concept in this problem. So that is the dr by dt or the rate at which the distance between any two particles is decreasing is a constant rate. So which basically means I can directly integrate on both sides. It's an easy, easy integral. Function of r, which is the distance between any two particles as a function of time is going to be the initial distance, which which is a that is the side of the square minus vt and from here we can also find out the time of convergence because uh, we know that when the all the particles will finally end up at the center so let's say that uh, time of convergence let's just call it t converge at this time r would be equal to zero which means this just become equal to a by v so after a time of a by v all the particles will meet at the center now in the first question they asked us the distance covered by each particle now guys the interesting thing about their velocity vectors is as you guys can see initially the velocity vector was like this after sometimes it is going to change in direction right but the magnitude of the velocity vector or the speed remains constant so therefore i can say that the distance covered uh, by each particle is nothing but their speed v multiplied by the total time and this just comes out to be v into a by v which is simply a and therefore the part a is actually correct now the second question they're asking us about the acceleration of each particle at a general time okay guys. so now for the acceleration we have to study the velocity vector so let's say at any general time t a velocity vector is in this direction now guys the velocity vector its magnitude as we discussed earlier is a constant which means uh, there cannot be a component of dv along the direction of the velocity vector because in in that case the magnitude would increase right so the change vector dv has to be perpendicular to the velocity vector because we know that the velocity vector is changing its direction right so initially it was in this direction after some time it will be in this direction so its direction is clearly changing so the change in velocity after dt time has to be perpendicular to our velocity vector so let's call it dv and our final velocity vector is going to be something like this right initial plus change equal to final Again, the magnitude is going to be constant. So let's just say this angle over here is d theta. So now if you look at this differential velocity diagram, uh, I can easily write dv as v times d theta by using the arc length formula. And if I divide both sides by dt, what I obtain is dv by dt. Acceleration only has one component again, guys. So dv by dt is nothing but the acceleration. V multiplied by the d theta by dt, which is the rate at which the velocity vector is rotating. Okay, so now let's determine the rate at which the velocity vector rotates. So, so this is particle one, this is particle two in the initial stage. And after some time dt, this particle will be over here. This particle will be over here. Let's join them. The velocity vector of this particle is going to be perpendicular to this line. The velocity of this particle is going to be along the line. Now observe this particle over here. So this angle d theta is the angle by which the velocity vector rotated. This angle d theta is same as the angle rotated by this position vector r. So the omega of the velocity vector is the same as the omega of this line, basically speaking. And the omega of this line is simply v divided by r, where r is the distance between these two particles, right? As we have determined omega, the acceleration a of the particle is nothing but v multiplied by d theta by dt, which we determined as v by r. So this comes out to be v square by r. Now guys, we know r is a function of time from over here. So this comes out to be v square divided by a minus vt. You can, direction you can easily get from this diagram over here it is always perpendicular to the velocity vector okay so now they want the acceleration at time t equal to t converge divided by phi which actually is going to be a divided by phi v so let's substitute it into our expression so we get the acceleration as 5 v square divided by 4a and that corresponds to option b and in option d they're saying the the radii of curvature at the of the particle t equal to a by 3v so acceleration at time t equal to tau by 3 is going to be 3v square by 2a, right? So the radii of curvature of the trajectory at that time is going to be the speed squared divided by the uh, normal acceleration. And acceleration, we know it's always normal anyway. So this is going to be 3v square by 2a. The answer comes out to be 2a by 3. So therefore, option D is also 
correct so the answer is abd now let's move on to the next question okay guys so and this is a problem from gravitation so and this problem is going to involve some geometrical properties of an ellipse so basically we have a satellite that is projected into the space from a point p uh, that is at a distance of 2r from the center of the earth at an angle of alpha so and the velocity of projection is given to be root gm by 2r it is found that the satellite is propelled into an elliptical orbit so basically we have to find out the eccentricity of the elliptical orbit okay so now let's begin with the analysis okay guys so let's say this is our elliptical orbit and the earth is present at this focus over here let's call it f1 if we have a satellite that is orbiting a planet in an elliptical orbit then the total energy e total of the satellite comes out to be in the elliptical orbit comes out to be g capital m small m divided by 2a a small m is the mass of the satellite capital m is the mass of the planet and 2a is actually the length of the major axis of this ellipse so and the interesting thing is that the total energy comes out to be independent of eccentricity so it just depends on the length of the major axis so in the given problem so this was the planet and let's say the particle was at some distance c for some time it was projected with a velocity of v naught at some angle 37 degrees and this v naught was given to be square root of gm by c so if you observe here it is root gm by 2r and 2r i just took it as c so this will be root gm by c this if you observe is actually the orbital velocity so basically if it was projected perpendicularly then it would have moved in a circle of radius c so what i'm doing is i'm going to write down the total energy of the satellite at the point p so that will be due to the kinetic energy which is half m v squared plus the potential energy which is minus g capital m small m uh, divided by the distance which is c and this comes out to be minus g capital m small m divided by 2c and this is the energy for of a satellite that is moving in an elliptical orbit semi major axis is 2c in the in our question the satellite is moving along this elliptical orbit whose semi major axis is 2c okay uh, and we obtain that by comparing it to our general result okay now comes the important part this part this point p is at a distance of c from the center of the planet which is actually the focus of this ellipse so now the question is where is that point on the elliptical orbit which is at a distance of c from the focus and the answer to that is it is actually at this point end point of the minor axis so let's say this is the minor axis this distance f1 p is actually c and the reason for that is this is a property of ellipse so if we have a prop point on the surface of the ellipse then the distance pf1 plus pf2 actually comes out to be 2c which is the length of the major axis so by symmetry we can see that these two lengths are equal so this has to be cc write it down as a result so so if we have if we project a satellite with an orbital velocity at some arbitrary angle which is not 90 degree with the radius vector of the planet then the point of projection becomes the end point of the minor axis so now it's just a matter of solving so our velocity v is going to be tangent tangential to the elliptical path and it has a magnitude of v naught at this point and it is given to make an angle of 37 degree with the radius vector so which basically means even this angle is 37 degrees this length over here is nothing but the length of the semi minor axis which is b for an ellipse the eccentricity is nothing but square root of 1 minus b square by a square where b is the length of the semi minor axis and a is the length of the semi major axis so in this case if you do b divided by c it comes out to be sin t sin 37 1 minus sin square 37 and take the root it comes out to be cos 37 which is nothing but 4 by 5 so the eccentricity is nothing but so the eccentricity comes out to be 0 0.8 Eight. so that was the concept for this question so now let's move on to the next question okay guys so this is the last problem so we have a solid cone of semi vertical angle of 30 degrees and its height is h cone is slightly rotated from its vertical position so this was the initial position it rotated by it is rotated by some angle theta about its horizontal axis passing through o and then it is released so we have to find the time period of small oscillations of the cone Okay guys, so uh, let's say this is our cone and for the solid cone, the center of mass actually lies at a distance of 3h by 4 from the apex. This is where the center of mass lies. So now let's say I displace this cone by a small angle of theta in the counterclockwise sense. So what will happen is this, so what's going to happen is this line OCM is going to rotate by the small angle of theta. Now I can easily determine the uh, gravity's torque. So the gravity is acting over here at the center of mass so the torque due to gravity is nothing but mg times 3h by 4 sine theta so now i took this problem in order to determine the moment of inertia of this cone about this axis over here so if you observe something guys the axis of rotation is actually this axis that is into the plane right so about this axis the moment of inertia of the cone you guys may or may not know 
So that is the reason why I took this problem. So uh, about this particular axis, the moment of inertia of a solid cone is actually 3 by 10 mR square. But about any horizontal axis passing through this point O, we actually have to figure it out. So let's try to do that. Now let's get rid of all this. Okay, so now let's just uh, figure it out about this axis because it's the same, right? If you Even if you take this axis, or the axis that is going into the plane, the moment of inertia is going to remain the same because of symmetry. So there is a trick to, you know, actually remember this, but the trick itself will take a lot of time to explain. So it's actually better to just, you know, integrate this in my opinion. So, so again, what I'm doing is I'm going a distance Y, taking a differential element, which in this case is going to be a disc, right? And I'm saying the radii of the disc is R and I can write R as Y tan theta, small r upon capital R equals small y upon H. Now coming to the moment of inertia part. So again, our axis of rotation is this axis over here, guys. So about this axis, so now we have to apply parallel axis theorem. So if you observe, this axis is the diametrical axis for this disc over here. So di of the small element is actually dicm plus dm y square. Okay, so now dicm, if you observe moment of inertia about the diametrical axis of a disc, and that is mr square by 4, right? So this will be dm r square divided by 4. So I'm going to write r as y tan theta. So this is going to be d y square tan square theta divided by 4 plus dm y square. So I can take the 1 plus tan square theta divided by 4 outside because it's a constant and this would the inner term would simply be integral dm y squared. Okay, so now the dm of the element is, uh, is going to be rho times dv and guys the dv of this disk element is pi r square multiplied by dy. Okay, and don't take this dz which is a slant differential distance. This is for the CSA of this part. For the volume you have to do pi r square times dy. So this is going to be rho pi r square dy. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is integrate this expression from 0 to h, which is the limits for y. And rho, I'm going to write it as the mass divided by the volume of the cone. And r, I can write it as h tan theta. And after substituting all the values, finally, you end up with this result for the moment of inertia about the horizontal axis passing through the apex of the cone. So if you know this, the question is pretty much done. So now I know the torque due to mg, right? It came out to be mg, 3h by 4. Now I should take the sign as negative because... Uh, if you remember, I displaced it towards in the counterclockwise sense with an angle of theta, right? And the torque came out to be in the clockwise sense. So as it is opposite to my theta convention, I should take the direction as negative. So, and this would be equal to the moment of inertia about the axis passing through O, which we figured out, uh, times the alpha, which is d square theta upon dt squared. So after substituting the value of theta as 30 degrees, uh, this is the differential equation that you obtain. And this is clearly, uh, as we can see, an equation of SHM. So the time period of oscillation is going to be 2 pi square root of 13 h divided by 15 g. And if you compare, uh, k will come out to be 3. Okay, so that was it for this video guys. If you enjoyed the video, please do like, share and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.